Japanese method to raise creative kids. Japanese people are known for their intelligence, politeness, and wellness. Why is this nation so unique and different from the rest of the world? It seems we found the answer. They have an incredibly cool education system and unique teaching methods. Watch till the end, there's a small but brilliant bonus for you. Let's start with a unique Japanese method in the schools for developing creativity in kids we believe that the whole world needs to adopt. It's called Nameless Paints. Japanese designers named Yasuki Imai and Ayami Moteki created an unusual set to teach kids colors and painting. This fantastic set won the 2012 Kokuyo Design Award. Let's see how it works. Nameless Paints includes 10 tubes that don't have color names, such as yellow, blue, or green. Instead, there are only spots of a particular color or colors on each tube. As you can see, the spots are also different sizes. The designer's aim is to change the way kids think and learn. They want children to understand what shade they will get if they mix certain colors. For instance, a child looks at the tube with two spots, pink and blue. He doesn't know what color hides inside. He squeezes the tube and gets purple color. So, as a result, the kid learns that the same amounts of pink and blue paints create purple. Here's another example, a tube with a big blue spot and a small pink one. It means if you mix a small amount of the pink color and a large amount of the blue color, you'll get dark blue color. Interesting, right? As you can see, each tube hides a particular color inside. Pink, yellow, blue, purple, red, dark green, dark blue, orange, light green, and black. However, to get one of these shades, the child should think about which colors create it. As a result, they learn how to create new colors and how to mix them. It's an easy and fun way to understand the color theory. Recent studies have shown that free thinking is an attribute that a person can acquire over time. And the schools play the most important part in developing creativity. Now, here's the bonus. 10 brilliant features of the Japanese education system the whole world needs to adopt. The success of the Japanese culture is very simple. They put a lot of effort and time in the education system, trying to make it not only useful, but also fun. 1. Manners before knowledge In Japanese schools, students don't take any exams until they reach grade 4, the age of 10. The goal for the first three years of school is not to judge the child's knowledge, but to establish good manners and to develop their character. Children are taught to respect other people and to be gentle with animals and nature. They also learn how to be generous, compassionate, and empathetic. Besides this, the kids are taught qualities like grit, self-control, and justice. 2. The academic year starts on April 1st. While most schools in the world begin their academic year in September or October, in Japan it is April that marks the start of the academic and business calendar. The first day of school often coincides with one of the most beautiful natural phenomena, the time of cherry blossom. The academic year is divided into three trimesters, April 1st till July 20th, September 1st till December 26th, and January 7th till March 25th. Japanese students get six weeks of holidays during the summer. They also have two-week breaks in winter and spring. 3. Students clean the school themselves. In Japanese schools, students have to clean the classrooms, cafeterias, and even toilets all by themselves. Most Japanese schools do not employ janitors or custodians. When cleaning, students are divided into small groups and assigned tasks that they rotate throughout the year. The Japanese education system believes that requiring students to clean up after themselves teaches them to work in a team and help each other. Besides, spending their own time and effort sweeping, mopping, and wiping makes kids respect their work and the work of others. 4. School lunch is provided on a standardized menu. 
the Japanese education system does its best to ensure that the students eat healthy and balanced meals. In public elementary and junior high school, the lunch for students is cooked according to a standardized menu, developed not only by qualified chefs, but also by healthcare professionals. All classmates eat in their classroom together with the teacher. This helps build positive teacher-student relation. Five, after-school workshops are very popular. To get into a good junior high school, most Japanese students enter a preparatory school or attend private after-school workshops. The classes in these schools are held in the evenings. Seeing groups of small kids returning from their extracurricular courses late in the evening is common in Japan. Japanese students have an eight-hour school day, but apart from that, they study even during the holidays and on weekends. It's no wonder that the students in this country almost never repeat grades, primary, lower secondary, or secondary school. Six, students learn Japanese calligraphy and poetry. Japanese calligraphy, or shoto, involves dipping a bamboo brush in ink and using it to write hieroglyphs on rice paper. For Japanese people, shoto is an art that is no less popular than traditional painting. Haiku, on the other hand, is a form of poetry that uses simple expressions to convey deep emotions to readers. Both classes teach children to respect their culture and centuries-old traditions. 7. Students have to wear a school uniform. Almost all junior high schools require their students to wear school uniforms. While some schools have their attire, traditional Japanese school uniform consists of a military style for boys and a sailor outfit for girls. The uniform policy is intended to remove social barriers among students and get them into a working mood. Besides, wearing school uniforms helps to promote a sense of community among the children. 8. The school attendance rate is about 99.99%. Probably all of us have played truant at least once in our life. However, Japanese students don't skip classes, nor do they arrive late for school. Moreover, around 91% of pupils in Japan reported that they never, or only in some classes, ignored what the teacher lectured. How many countries can boast such statistics? Education is a common topic of conversation. If you're going to talk with Americans about going to school or being a student, it will certainly help to have an understanding of the U.S. system of education. I'd like to give you an overview of the system. Then you'll have an idea about the kind of educational experience one can have in the U.S. By the end, you might also then find it easier to talk about the educational system in your own country. Here in the U.S., one's school experience might begin as a baby at a place called daycare. Daycare is a popular choice among working parents. So children stay at daycare, the parents go to work. In the U.S., a good daycare not only takes care of very young children, but also begins to provide what we call an early childhood education. Once a child is three or four, he or she can go to preschool. Preschool in the U.S. is not mandatory. It's not required. Preschool programs might be five days a week or just a few days a week. Once a child turns five, the child can attend kindergarten. These are names of the programs. A child in preschool is called a preschooler. A child in kindergarten is called a kindergartner. 
Kindergarten is also not mandatory. The law varies from state to state. So in some states, kindergarten is mandatory. In other states, it's not. I do believe, though, that school districts must offer a kindergarten program so that there is that choice. Some kindergarten programs are half-day programs, morning or afternoon. Some kindergarten programs are full-day programs. After kindergarten, a child goes to first grade. In the U.S., we have 12 grades. From school district to school district, the organization of these grades is different. They group them together in different ways. In general, it all begins with elementary school. Sometimes called primary school. You might also hear grade school. Elementary school is for the lower grades. You might find grades kindergarten through third or kindergarten through fifth at an elementary school. For the middle grades, children go to middle school. So a middle school might have fourth through eighth or fifth through eighth grades. Again, it varies from school district to school district. After middle school comes high school. Again, you might find some differences, but in general, in the U.S., we think of high school as a four-year program. That's 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grades. We can say 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, but we also have special ways to refer to those last four years. We can say freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, and senior year. So if someone is a sophomore in high school, they have two more years to go. A sophomore is in 10th grade. When one finishes high school, we say he or she graduates from high school. When you graduate from high school, you receive a high school diploma. In the U.S., it is not mandatory to graduate from high school. The law varies from state to state, but in general, a child must attend school until about the age of 16. That's 10th grade. After high school, many choose to go to college. That's because many professions require a higher education. Higher education refers to anything after high school. High school provides secondary education. College, higher education. When we say a person is in college, that means the person attends either a college or a university. In the U.S., colleges and universities both have four-year programs. When someone finishes this undergraduate program, this person can receive their first degree. It's a bachelor's degree. It could be a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science, BA, BS. In college, we have four years. We can talk about those four years the same way we talk about those last four years in secondary school, high school, freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, senior year. So we have to be specific when we say someone is a senior, do you mean a senior in high school or a senior in college? A freshman in college has three more years before graduation. I should note that outside the U.S., 
there is sometimes an understanding that going to a university is somehow more prestigious than going to a college. In fact, in the U.S., we have prestigious universities and prestigious colleges. They both offer undergraduate programs, four-year programs. When a person finishes college, he or she can study further and attend graduate school. A person in graduate school is a graduate student. In contrast, a person in college is an undergraduate student. In graduate school, one can pursue a master's degree. That's a Master of Arts or Master of Science, MA or MS. If one goes to a business school and studies business, the person can receive an MBA, that's Master of Business Administration. If one chooses to study even further, the person can receive the highest degree possible, that's a PhD. PhD stands for Doctor of Philosophy. When a person holds a PhD, we can address this person as doctor. Let's explain a little about the education system in Australia. Your children's education will undoubtedly be a really important factor in having a successful relocation. It's one of the first things we get asked about, so we thought we'd give you some study notes on schools in Australia. The school education system is similar across the country, with minor variations between the states. School education is compulsory until 16. Most children start school at 5, in what is referred to as either kindergarten or prep. School education runs for 13 years and is divided into primary school and secondary school. There's no middle school in the Australian system. The school year starts at the end of January, ends mid-December and is divided into four terms of 9 to 12 weeks. The main summer holidays are roughly six weeks over Christmas, with shorter breaks for Easter in June and in September. Families from the Northern Hemisphere often have to consider whether their child will repeat some of the year or go forward. Your chosen school will be able to advise the best year for your child to start in. So when do you start school? Well, children can start school in the year they turn five, provided their birthday falls before the cut-off date. Each state has its own cut-off date. For example, in New South Wales the cut-off date is the 31st of July. Therefore, if you were born on the 1st of March 2012, you will start kindergarten in 2017. However, if you were born on the 1st of September 2012, you won't start kindergarten until 2018. Entering other grades can be worked out in the same way. Whichever school your child attends, whether it's public, private or a religious school, it must follow the same educational framework which is set by the state. Government funded schools are called public schools. Primary schools are co-educational. And secondary or high schools may be co-educational or single sex. Primary schools are often on a different campus to senior schools. Most public schools will accept students of any academic ability though you will generally need to live within the school's catchment area or zone to attend. There are some public schools which are academically selective, but these are only open to Australian residents and citizens. Some states require temporary visa holders to pay an education fee to attend a public school. Again, this varies by state, but can be as much as $6,000 per child per year, so be aware of this potential additional cost. Private schools are independent, fee-paying schools. Children are often enrolled to these schools well in advance, sometimes at birth, and it can be difficult to get a place, particularly in certain year groups. Some private schools are selective, and an entry exam or assessment may be required. Fees at private schools range from $10,000 to $35,000 per year. 
Most offer good on-site facilities and lower student-teacher ratios. Boarding facilities are available at selected private schools for an additional fee. Then we have faith schools, for example Jewish, Catholic or Anglican. These schools are designed to serve the community of that religion, though sometimes exceptions are made. Fees for local Catholic schools can range from $1,000 to $20,000 per year. There are very few international schools in Australia, so international students will attend a school with Australian children, studying the Australian curriculum. Some schools offer the International Baccalaureate. We also have some schools that follow a specific philosophy, such as Montessori and Steiner schools. In order to understand how schools are performing, Australia has a national testing standard in literacy and numeracy conducted at different stages of children's school life. The results are available through the My School website, which allows you to search the profile and results of 10,000 schools in Australia and encourages comparison. However, unlike in other countries, league tables have not traditionally been a popular way to judge a school's performance, so be aware that there are other factors in picking the right school for your child. What's the education system like in China? Chinese children over six years old are allowed to enter primary school. After six years education here, they spend three years in junior middle school. This nine-year education they receive is called National Compulsory Education, which requires all school-age children to be educated free of charge. Following compulsory education, Chinese students will sit their first important lifetime test, the Senior High School Entrance Examination, Zhang Kao. Based on the results in personal choices, 87% of students step into senior secondary education, and 57% go to regular senior secondary schools to gain cultural and scientific knowledge, while 43% enter secondary vocational schools to be trained with skills for employment. In most provinces, those who enter regular schools will be divided into classes focused on social sciences, Chinese, English, mathematics, politics, history, and geography, or natural sciences, Chinese, English, mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology. Whichever one they choose decides what they will be tested on during the college entrance examination, Gao Kao, their second important exam. The total point of the examination is 750. In fact, there are six foreign languages that can be chosen. English is the most popular. Whether students enter the university they prefer depends on their final scores and the enrollment mark of the university. Therefore, Gao Kao is greatly significant to Chinese. That's why most senior students in high school work hard to prepare for the examination under huge pressure. However, China has implemented historic education system reform. Gao Kao will adopt a 3 plus 3 model. All subjects require higher level Chinese, especially in traditional Chinese culture. Chinese education points to comprehensive personal development oriented education. Gao Kao tends to select examinees on the basis of majors. Joyce cannot imagine having her son Nemo in school for the entire day, but that could soon be a reality. Indonesia's education minister proposed a brand new plan to extend school hours. The full-day school system supposedly caters to full-time working parents who'd rather keep their children occupied in school until the end of their work hours. I don't think it's effective at all. It doesn't just affect children. The teachers in charge will also be tired from working overtime. And also, what about food? Do they expect us to prepare it? Or can the schools guarantee that they will provide nutritious meals for our children for the whole day? The system will make it compulsory for all elementary and high school students to stay in school until 5 p.m., learning religious studies and engaging in extracurricular activities. The education minister believes that setting promotes a positive learning environment. Eddie agrees with that. As an educator, he believes the new system could help broaden children's knowledge. 
He says focusing heavily on academic studies is crucial in shaping his students' future. The full day school system will help make children more diligent in their studies. In our school, children already start their day at 6.30 in the morning and go home at around 4 in the afternoon. They seem to have fun and enjoy the activities. Indonesia's education system has been under pressure for a long time. Many argue that its traditional ways of teaching are not suitable in today's creative society. Examination is not everything. Uh, it's just one thing that can evaluate uh, the cognitive uh, aspect of the children, but not the whole um, uh, competence of the kids. Research shows that during Indonesia's annual national examinations, students record high stress levels, leading to an increase of violent behaviors in schools. Instead, schools around Indonesia should work on introducing project-based learning, allowing students to understand the importance of knowledge beyond books. In recent years, the education sector has become a central focus for the UAE. Its reform and improvement represents a necessity in the country's ongoing development aim. However, there are major challenges for policymakers if they are to succeed in economic diversification and reduced reliance on foreign labor. Educational attainment levels have made significant leaps and bounds since the country's inception. In 1975, adult and youth literacy rates in the adult were approximately 54% and 63%. These rates grew to 71% and 82% respectively in 1985, representing increases of 33% and 30%. By 2005, literacy rates had reached over 90% in the adult population and over 95% in the youth population. In 2010, there were 1,190 schools in the UAE, although 61% of the schools in the country are public. 58% of the students in the country attend private schools. The UAE's public school system boasts one of the best student-teacher ratios in the world at 15 to 1. The late president of the UAE, his Highness Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nahyan stated the greatest use that can be made of wealth is to invest it in creating generations of educated and trained people. The UAE's current leadership has embraced this wisdom. In 2010, the UAE's federal budget stood at $11.9 billion, of which $2.67 billion was allocated to education, representing 22.5% of the total budget. In the 2011 budget, the allocation for education and social development was doubled and accounts for 46% of the 2011 budget, thus clearly demonstrating that education is one of the UAE's main strategic priority. A key component of the government's strategy has been the decentralization of educational authority from the Federal Ministry of Education to the local education bodies in each emirate. Three major bodies, the Ministry of Education, which has full jurisdiction over the Northern Emirates, the Abu Dhabi Educational Council, and Dubai's Knowledge and Human Development Authority are working to improve the sector. Education reform in the UAE focuses on better preparation, greater accountability, higher standards, and improved professionalism. Additionally, rote instruction is being replaced with more interactive forms of learning and English language education is being integrated into other subjects such as math and science. The nation is poised to become a regional hub for higher education. Several emirates including Abu Dhabi, Dubai and Ras Al Khaimah have declared intent to become educational hubs. Federal universities are expanding to accommodate the growing numbers of students. Foreign universities are flocking to the UAE to set up offices and satellite campuses, and the government has embarked on several partnerships that have brought top global universities to the UAE to establish full-fledged campuses. Whereas some sectors of the economy have faced the turmoil caused by the international economic downturn, 
education has continued to show strong signs of growth. One of the key components to world-class tertiary education is research, which has historically been lacking in the region. The UAE is attempting to develop its research capacity, and research initiatives are central to the UAE's educational agenda. However, there are challenges associated with developing a research capacity in the country. Established global research centers require funding, human capital, infrastructure, and a legacy of research, all of which are current priorities for the leadership of the UAE. Like in many other sectors, the UAE is trying to shorten the amount of time required to develop its research capacity by involving the private sector.